Hello, so I am going to be uh, building and debugging along the way a serverless RDS instance. Um, for AWS, I've used this in the past, um, but I don't currently have a template in my CloudFormation reference um, repository, so I wanted to go ahead and make one. Um, while I'm going through it, um, I will also uh, build in some, I'll just call it basic. Um, I'll also build in some some extra features. Uh, the secret will be automatically generated for us and we will be able to restore or create a new RDS instance based off of a snapshot. So that is the plan for today. Um, as I've done in the past and as I will continue to do, I do not have anything set up. I am going to be making this for the first time. Um, but I have done this in the past. So it's not... Um, the idea behind it all isn't necessarily foreign to me. I, I do more or less know what needs to be done for for the um, RDS instance uh, to be launched. Um, I will go ahead and I'll talk about it in just a second. What all we need, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just Actually, I, we will have an output. We will do the, uh, the secret ARN. Oops. The secret to the uh, to the database that it'll have we'll see it once we get there but it will have anything that um, would be relevant for I would argue for most database connections so uh, you'll see it once we get there but there's something in RDS um, there's something you can do um, you can add a secret attachment oh, I guess it's in secrets manager so we need to find secrets manager. There it is. So there's a secret, and then there's also a secret target attachment. And a secret target attachment takes a secrets ID, which we will be creating here. It takes a target ID, um, which the service or database credential stored, sort of, in the secret, and then a target type. So for us, it will be an RDS DB cluster because I will be creating a serverless RDS instance, which is really a database cluster. And then as you need instances, RDS handles the scaling for you. It will create or tear down instances as needed instead of creating a cluster and then creating instances in the cluster and having them more or less statically defined which instances. I I like serverless things. So um, we have a secret ID, the target ID. The target ID will be... I believe it's a reference to the TV um, cluster, uh, and then then it'll it'll populate the secret with host name, database name. If we give it a default database, um, port, username, password, all those kinds of good things. So this uh, this should be this should be a a fun one to go through. I have, like I said, I have done this before, so it shouldn't be too off the wall for me. Um, so let's go ahead and start. Um, we will need um, I'll just call it cluster. We already know it's a DB. We already know it's a database. Um, I changed this to VPC stack in this time, this one, 
I'll just go ahead and change them all. Um, I think VPC stacks a little bit better than just VPC, so not that it really matters at the end of the day, but um, there it is. Um, VPC Um, so I already have my VPC stack created um, and now I will go through it all let's see associated roles I, there's a lot of this stuff that I don't think you need so I'll just go through one by one no availability zones no that'll probably be chosen 3d subnets backtrack window uh, that's new um, I'm not exactly sure what that is. My guess is it has something to do with uh, being able to rewind database. Uh, um, transactions. Database name. This is something that I will. Backup retention period. Number of days for which automated backups are retained. Because you can set up automatic backups if you so choose. Um, the, the method that I will be showing. Um, the way to create a database from a manual snapshot not a backup though there are in AWS RDS there are backups and there are manual snapshots and manual snapshot from what I understand is pretty much just an image or a like a binary of the machine that it's all running on so it can be from nothing you can just recreate it and a backup I think you need it it's more like a diff so you would need backups um, starting from a, a single one that has other information, other necessary information in it, and then you, you play the backups in a certain order in order to uh, recreate a database if, if that's what you need to do. Uh, so I'm not going to do any of those, but I will do a database name. Uh, I will just call it test. Uh, or uh, default default db okay db cluster identifier um, I don't like I've said this before I, I don't like giving names I like letting AWS pick the names for me just because um, I don't I don't want pets, I want cows. Cluster parameter group name. Yeah, you, so you can create parameter groups uh, like this. I, I haven't done this before, um, but if uh, that's what you'd like to do, you, you can create parameter groups, and I think this has to do with well, just a group of, of parameters, like a configuration, and then you can, yeah, you can propagate that. Those, those parameters across databases but if you're doing it from confirmation template I'm not exactly sure what that would give you what what benefit that would give you um, a subnet group I wonder how it does subnets because it says it's not required um, this is something that we will have to create or it's something that I have created in the past but if you don't define it, I don't really know what it does. I don't know if it gives you a default or not, but I'm pretty sure you need it. Oh, that's security group. I need subnet group. Yeah. And for this template we will not be making uh, or creating sorry any um, IAM roles or anything like that maybe security groups but yeah I think probably security groups uh, default subnet group subnet group name oh, I'm not going to have that subnet IDs I don't need tags Tags are a good thing to do if you're in a, an enterprise setting. I would suggest looking into tagging 
your CloudFormation templates and AWS resources. Um, okay, so I do need to import subnet IDs, and those are exported here. So I will import by this, and I have somewhere in here. There it is. I need that import value statement. So I need. Subnet AID. We'll just do uh, subnet A and subnet B. How about that? I don't know if it needs one or two or if it doesn't matter, but that's a subnet group. That's pretty easy. And this is just tell well, you can read more about it here, but um, this is just telling the cluster which subnet, oh, I don't need that, subnet group name. Uh, it's telling the, the cluster where, um, where the instances can be launched and where they should be available. Uh, the, the instances in the cluster. Deletion protection, um, I, so this is where it gets a little uh, up to engineering decision. I suggest turning this on in production, but you don't have to in other environments. Um, I, yeah, it's, off by default, um, which means that the database can be deleted, which is fine. Um, it's, it's sometimes helpful to think in terms of ephemeral infrastructure. You don't want to necessarily be on one exact thing uh, on 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 uh, or tied to any piece of infrastructure. But when it comes to data storage, it gets a little different. Um, I'm not as well versed in this area as other areas of AWS and cloud engineering but um, yeah th they're probably depending on what kind of uh, product or team you're working on they're probably SLAs that determine um, what kind of data needs to be retained for X amount of days or months or years and um, what your uptimes are and, and things like that. Uh, I I guess that doesn't really necessarily help in, in a decision for deletion protection, but I would say it's not necessary. This is just saying that the database can't be deleted or the cluster can't be deleted, but um, there's inherently nothing wrong with that. Uh, hopefully your accounts are locked down a little bit more than just letting anyone have the opportunity to delete whatever cluster they want to and hopefully engineers that have access to an AWS account are a little bit smarter than um, potentially just deleting a random database that they found. Um, enable CloudWatch logs exports. Um, that's good stuff to have if you're trying to debug something. If you're doing any anything you know, really uh, database intensive and you you want to make sure that stuff's flowing correctly uh, I've personally never really looked at them I don't even turn them on um, enable HTTP endpoint uh, don't need that enable IAM database authentication this could be a good thing to get set up especially if there are multiple people trying to get access to a uh, database you can just do all the authentication through IAM just have it all built in. Pretty cool stuff. Um, for engine, I'm just going to use Aurora. Uh, Aurora, my I've used Aurora MySQL in the past. I'm sure Postgres is also good. Um, the reason I'm going to do Aurora and try to stick with Aurora is because with Aurora you can do serverless. Um, 
uh, serverless engine. So yeah, Aurora has uh, the ability to do serverless, and then you're well. In this sense, serverless doesn't necessarily mean that you're not um, messing with a server because the well RDS is a managed database so you're not messing with a server anyway you're pretty much just telling it your configuration and then AWS takes care of the rest but um, where is that the provision serverless looks weird to me but um, yeah I'm pretty sure you just need serverless maybe it's provision serverless we'll find out um, yeah, so serverless, I guess, in this sense, what I was getting back to is more or less just that AWS will handle provisioning. Oh, maybe that's why provision serverless. Um, they'll handle provisioning, and they will create and tear down instances of your databases as need be. Um, one real quick note that I will talk about while we're on serverless for Aurora I have in the past had terrible problems with cold start times on these serverless RDNs instances. Um, uh, unsurprisingly, it takes a long time to spin a database up. Um, if, yeah, I don't know, I don't, would not recommend doing this in a production environment, but for a Developers, it's fine because they'll probably be able to figure out pretty quickly what's going on. You'll just get database timeouts, and then once you try to hit them again, the database will be up. Um, it saves a ton of money, a ton of money. So I would recommend this for environments where some failure can be tolerated. Once it's the real deal, you can set, and I, I will... Sh point this out in just a second it's the scaling configuration right here but you can set in scaling configuration that there's a minimum of one instance always up for your database uh, and that's what I recommend because you let it spin up if more traffic comes in but don't let it tear all the way down and just shut off because then if a user comes to your service and they they need your they needed some sort of database transaction and your database wasn't warm when they first first got to it then they could get a timeout depending on what the timeout is and that just doesn't look good so um, where you can tolerate timeouts and failures let the serverless scaling configuration go to zero because it costs a lot less where you cannot tolerate those go ahead and bump it to have a, a minimum um, and we'll see that in a second once we get there. So engine version, I'm not going to mess with. Global cluster identifier, I'm not going to mess with. It's just like a naming thing. It'll it'll be in the URL. KMS key, I'm not going to mess with. Can I'll just use the default KMS key. Master username. This is where we get into. Um, this is where we get into some some secrets manager stuff. This is where we'll need it. Um, so I'm going to. I delete these guys. Uh, port, I'm just going to do default. It'll default to 3306 for my SQL. For backup window, again, I'm not doing backups. Prefer maintenance window. So this is this is good stuff, especially when you're, you know, if you need a DBA to go in and and, and do some maintenance. Um, I do believe that if RDS has to do some sort of change that will involve downtime it will automatically schedule that even if you tell it to change manually it'll schedule something in a maintenance window um, this is the part that I will be going over this replication source identifier um, this is where you would give it a um, oh snapshot identifier. Sorry, I was jumping the gun. Um, replication source identifier. You can do the same thing but with a DB that hasn't had a manual snapshot taken of it. You can create a duplicate of a cluster or an instance um, using an ARN. 
Uh, what I want, what I was referring to originally was the snapshot identifier, where if you take a snapshot, you can give it the ARN and it will back up. Um, it'll back up the, uh, or sorry, it will launch a database cluster given the backup that you gave it. Um, once you create it, using a snapshot identifier you always have to give it that snapshot identifier so if it is a parameter if the snapshot identifier which is how I'm going to set it up um, in this but you can set it up any, any way you would like if you uh, if it's a parameter that parameter can never change if someone ever deletes that parameter it's going to delete your da database and create a brand new database that is not based off of the snapshot identifier so if this parameter changes it pretty much means that I think it's deletion um, update requires replacement so it's it's going to delete what is there and then rebuild it um, which could potentially be fine depending on what you're going for but uh, yeah just that's a good thing to keep in mind restore type full copy yeah, so that's the default. Full copy is default, which is what I'll do. Um, scaling configuration. Let's go ahead and get into that real quick. I don't think it takes too long. There you go. Auto pause. So this is when it tears itself down. Right? Yeah, okay. When there are no connections. Um, wait, this might be new. Auto pause might be new. Um, pause when it's idle. Okay, so I guess this is how it scales down to zero because now the valid capacity for serverless, the minimum is one. Yeah, interesting. And then you specify. So I think it used to always be. It used to be for me max capacity, min capacity. I don't remember completely, but um, yeah, uh, there you go. You can you can give it different capacities. You can cap it at one, um, which is probably what I'll do. Uh, well, uh, whatever. Let's do let's do 128. 128 max capacity, min capacity is one seconds until auto pause. Uh, we'll say 30, so it's going to pause really quickly and auto pause. Yes, I want it to auto pause. Um, snapshot identifier. I'm going to have it passed in this way. So this is, I've done this in the past and I had pretty good success with it. Um, I'll just make a condition uh, further down in the template and match the string none. And if it's, <coughs> if it's none, that means that I'm trying to build a new database. If it is not none, that means that there's a snapshot ARN that we're supposed to be building off of. Um, I think you can make this, I won't mess with it right now, but I think you can uh, there are different types of uh, like AWS specific parameters uh, that you can build off of or you can put a, uh, in the parameters you can you can match it to a regex so you could put a regex in for an ARN to make sure that it, whatever is entered is in fact an ARN um, or the word none so you can constrict it uh, but uh, I might do that later on but uh, I, I won't do that right now <laughs> And then here we're going to have conditions um, is new db and is snapshot db. Um, and we'll build those out in just a second. 
but let's continue on with this. So we have the snapshot identifier, and we're going to ref the snapshot ARN. We don't need that. Source DB cluster identifier. Um, source region. We don't need that. Storage encrypted. Uh, I feel like it should default to true. But uh, oh, then you must enable encryption. Ah, I feel like it would default to true, but maybe not. Maybe you need to set up uh, KMS. Maybe it doesn't just use a default one. Uh, VPC security group IDs. Use the latest restorable time. So all that stuff, it doesn't matter for me. Plan up to the resources. Okay, and then you have security groups. So we will have to create security groups, um, which is fine. Um, <coughs> let's, um, I'm going to move all this around. that it's referenced afterwards security groups and this I will use this as my security group um, That's fine, and then in here, um, it should probably be in a. I forget the. Uh, Thirty-three oh six. Thirty-three oh six. And egress. Um, I'll leave all that blank. I'll just let uh, let 3306 in. Um, I will say this is a a good um, a good time to bring up different VPC configurations. The VPC that I'm using, I just have all of the subnets as public subnets. Um, which means that they all have a route. So all of my subnets, I have A, B, C, and D, they're all associated with one route table, and that route table has an, a, a route to an internet gateway, um, which means that those subnets are public because they can get to the internet and the internet can get to them. Um, this is as far as I, I have uh, understood from AWS. Um, it is suggested and I would also suggest that um, you do not put databases especially with production data in a public subnet they need to be in a private subnet that cannot be reached from the internet you have to either be on the V well yeah you have to be in the VPC in order to get to your uh, your RDS instance. So one way to do that would be to put it in the correct uh, subnet group. So my subnets here, they shouldn't just be public, they should be private subnets. And then the CIDR IPs should also be locked down to only allow from subnet A and B, which are 10 0 and 10 0 1 0. Um, be very careful with this kind of stuff, with this networking stuff, because that can get out of hand uh, pretty quickly. And no one wants to be responsible for exposing sensitive data to the internet. So it's, uh, yeah. Do security audits and checks and, and just be very careful. About that kind of stuff. Um, 
I, that might be all for the, the cluster. Um, let's go to the secret and secret target attachment. See if there's a, yeah, here we go. So this is what I actually used last time um, to build all this out. Secret and secret target attachment. Th these things are meant for this purpose exactly. So we can generate a secret we can we can I'll go ahead and just pull this in right now we can generate a secret I don't use quotes oh. so we, we right here what we're saying is uh, we're generating a secret this is the username and we want to generate a string where we want to generate a secret uh, with starting with this username admin and then we want to generate string key password whenever you 16 long exclude those characters um, and the reason those are excluded is because those are not allowed in MySQL passwords then uh, it creates the RDS instance so we have all this all this good stuff. They're not using serverless, so some of the things here are going to be different than um, what I'm showing in my template. Then we have this master username, master password, which I also have, but I do not have filled in because I needed these values. Um, huh, I wonder if uh, you might have to do it like this. I'll uh, I'll do it a little bit differently. I believe this is the corresponding syntax. I believe we'll find out once we uh, plug it all into console but what it's saying is you take the secret from okay I'll, uh, I'll just call it secret or uh, credentials so we'll plug it in there um, what we're saying is this is a dynamic resolution so this has to be created, so uh, we'll put a, I'll put a dependency in here. Depends on credentials. So credentials needs to be created. Uh, it is ref, so that would implicitly say it depends on it. So since this is ref. It will create the credentials, it will create the secret, and then it will dynamically resolve the username and, I don't know why this is, okay, that's why, and the password, and that's what it will use the master username and master password for this cluster. Well, it'll come from these, from that secret, and the password is dynamically generated. If you don't want admin, if you want something special, you can put that in as a parameter and then bring it in, all that kind of stuff. Then the last part would be the secret target attachment. Um, oops. So the target attachment will reference the secret, reference the cluster, whatever it is, and then it will add any additional information about this cluster that should be needed in this secret to that secret. That was a little confusing there for just a second, but um, yeah, it, it once once this spins up, um, you'll be able to see the uh, DB cluster, the um, the information in there. Um, it, it'll have the host and the host name and the port and 
all the other information that um, you could potentially need to connect to that database. So, um, oh, I forgot. I never created these. Um, so since I'm, I'll add those in later, but since I'm not going to worry about the conditions, I'm, I'm oh, whoops. I'm just trying to uh, get this out the door and get this, this working. Um, I'm not going to worry about those conditions right now. I'll add them in in just a second. So, credentials. Oops. What is the, how do I get the name? I need the return value. The ref it returns the ARN, so perfect. Okay. Let's try that again. Um, yes, stack. No snapshot ARN. There's the VPC stack. And there were no more for no, no further problems, so we'll see if this all spins up. Um, almost invariably, there'll be a problem. But, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll get lucky this time. Aha! So there we go. Now I'm going to start needing to fill out these conditions because I it won't even start without them. Um, so there are... Uh, let me get this out. Yes. Um... Two things here: the conditions, and then also the um, the uh, pseudo AWS pseudo parameters. So there is a pseudo parameter, a special pseudo parameter called no value, and this is what I'll be using. In uh, we'll see. Look, it's even with a, a database right there. So this is what I'll be using. Um, to to show uh, to, to, to show this working where, where you could reboot by a snapshot or you can create from from nothing so the yeah this stuff gets a little iffy I, I don't really like dealing with the uh, writing the conditions but um, it just looks like weird syntax to me and once you start yeah once you start throwing in like knots and uh, ands and ors and, and you make more complicated conditions, it gets a little, the syntax looks a little funky just because you have to start nesting arrays, but um, we, we can make this work. So, um, if it's a new DB, we're going to reference snapshot ARN and we want that to equal none. That means it's a new DB because there's no snapshot for us to go off of. Um, now we're going to have to bring in the not because it's going to be not equal to uh, this. So. Um, there's that, and this it's going to be not equals to this. So I need not. And then not is also in. Each one is different, and they get very weird. So it's just a single condition in an array. So not equals is what I'm talking about. It gets kind of kind of weird not equals this and just for my own sake I'm going to use the same syntax in both places so that it's a little clearer what I'm going for okay so if it's a new database then snapshot ARM will equal none if it's a snapshot DB then 
it will not equal none. It will not be not equal to either one. Uh, <laughs> there will be an ARN there. Um, while I'm here, let me see. There should be. Um, let me find those uh, regexes and stuff that I was talking about before. Um, constraint description. No, maybe type. Okay. There, yeah, that's how you do a regex. You do a constraint description. Oh, interesting. Is that really it? Huh. I don't know if I believe that, but... Nope. Don't want that. I won't work on this too long, but... Okay, well... Yeah, since I don't have this figured out um, right now, I'm just going to make this a comment. And, uh, I'll f figure that out later. But I want it to be either an ARN or none and then it'll match it'll make sure that I'm inputting an ARN um, and it would be for a snapshot so you can uh, you can you can make sure that it's it fits there's a, a certain you know AWS uh, snapshot whatever it'll it'll have AWS and then the account ID and then the region and then it'll have a, a certain pattern that it'll follow to get to the snapshot um, so that's one way you can confirm that you're actually looking at a snapshot before you uh, just try to run it. So back to CloudFormation, it had an it was upset because both snapshot identifier and master username cannot be specified. So um, what you need to do is you can add a condition in to CloudFormation um, you can add an if there it is so you can use if and then condition name value true value false so kinda like a like a ternary operator is what you're doing and you can you can throw this in anywhere and if you don't want so for instance snapshot identifier if I'm adding something here and I want the the false value to be it doesn't exist at all I acted like I never put anything in I want it to be I, I don't just put null or anything like that the, the equivalent would be AWS no value so let's go ahead and do this real quick um, Syntax. So, huh? So it's weird the way that they. I guess that that one makes a little more sense to me. So I'm gonna do it that way. Um, oh, I don't know if you can. It. Uh, huh? Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, I can still make this work. Um, if. 
So there are three different con uh, array, uh, three different indices in this array. So if it is a snapshot DB, if I am creating it from a snapshot, use DB snapshot. So here we go. This is what I'm trying to do here, more or less. Then use the DB snapshot name. Oh, did I do this right? There. Otherwise, it's a no value. It's null, or that's pretty much what AWS no value means. So, snapshot identifier. If it is a snapshot DB, if we're restoring it from a snapshot, then use snapshot ARN. Otherwise, no value, and it, it's like it doesn't even exist. So that's that's what we're trying to do here. Um, now. We want to do the same thing with this guy, except it gets a little more finicky because we're joining in the middle of it all. So all this has to be tapped in. So this is if it's true, and this is if it's false, and we're going to use if it is a new database. I hope this makes sense. Um, what we're saying is if if it's a new database then I want you to use the secrets manager credentials that I gave you earlier. Otherwise if it, that means it's a snapshot DB because is new DB and is snapshot DB are just inverses of each other then I want you to use uh, then it's no value and I want you to use snapshot. So um, another way to do this, instead of having is new DB and is snapshot DB, is only have is new DB and change this this order. So if it's a new DB, then snapshot identifier doesn't matter at all. Or if it is a snap restore, if it, we're using a snapshot DB, then we use the snapshot error in. Um, but I'm gonna. I'm going to leave it in these two just because this is what I'm more familiar with. However you want to handle this logic is up to you. Um, but hopefully the logic and the, the reasoning behind it all is is understandable enough uh, for now. Let's go back through and try to recreate this. Or try to create this. We're not recreating it because we haven't created it in the first place. But we'll see. Nope. Seconds until pause must be between. I think I said like 30. So that's definitely not what it was looking for. Seconds until, until pause. Huh, they might just have that uh, Hmm. Interesting. It's not the maybe not the not the best um, status there. Uh, yeah. I'll go ahead. I'll just make this three thousand. Sure. Just make sure we're we're in that sweet spot. Um, yeah. That's not the best. Error that I've ever seen from them. Uh, those names didn't really seem to match up, but I guess there's really only one property that is uh, close enough to that to, to really make sense. Uh, so, like I pointed to before, uh, so I make all my stuff. Oh, I do have to give it a. Uh, Where's my database name? 
Oh, okay. Well, that's my fault. Um, I make all of my stuff. The, the reason why I'm building this off of a CloudFormation template from the very start is because I can take this template and I can drag and drop it anywhere and I can create and delete at will and this is what really gives you the power of AWS in my opinion this is what makes it all developer friendly it's all just API's and these I try to think of it as a resource is just saying this is like a a post this is like a cr telling your service to create something new and then I can reference what I had already created in subsequent API calls and this is how I configured it and you know um, this is how this is where I think it gets the name infrastructure's code because you are kind of your it's, it's configuration but people like to consider it code um, and as I've talked about before this stuff can get a little out of hand it can get expensive um, oh that's good it's creating and it hasn't aired out yet um, so I would just reiterate as so many people before me have done that this the, the, the cost can get out of hand and you have to enter a credit card number to set up an AWS account it can get costly it's extremely possible for that to happen just little tiny API calls here and there they start racking up and you know 50 cents might turn into a couple bucks and then a couple bucks might turn into a couple hundred um, RDS isn't cheap either it's launching a full database cluster and auto provisioning instances for you that can get really expensive especially if it's like what I'm doing isn't you know it's not best practice but it will for the time being while it's while I have this stack up, it will be exposed to the internet, and people could potentially rack up a bill for me. Um, I'm not going to let that happen uh, because it's all confirmation templates. I'm going to tear it down. Um, before this video is ever published, it's all going to be gone. It's all going to be away, uh, and that's on purpose. That's by design. Um, I can take a confirmation template. I can throw it into an AWS account that I've never been in before, and I can get all the all the configuration that I want to. I can architect something the exact same way as I had in another account just by having my CloudFormation template set up correctly. Um, and that's really, that's the power of it. That's where AWS, in my opinion, shines and where you get the full benefit of using the cloud. So that's why I have been doing my videos using CloudFormation templates and why I put reference CloudFormation templates on GitHub. Um, while I personally get a lot of use out of it because I can go back and I can um, look at the CloudFormation templates that I have created in the past, base new projects off of it, base new infrastructure off of it, configuration, show, you know, have, have a, I just need a baseline and then I can configure how I need to. But it's a, it's a good starting point to know that I can take that template, I can put it into CloudFormation and I can get infrastructure whenever I need to. Um, that, that's the huge benefit of it. So that's why I go off of uh, CloudFormation template for everything. Um, there is another option which I have been exploring recently, but have not gotten extremely proficient at and that's the AWS CDK and it seems to me like AWS is starting to push that more and more and that that will be that will start to be their uh, I don't know if it when it will be the de facto but I imagine in the future at some point in time that will be their um, preferred way of creating and configuring infrastructure in the cloud and the CDK is uh, it, it's actually infrastructure as code. You write JavaScript, Python, Java, uh, or uh, I forget the other languages that they have the CDK available in. You write code. Um, it's, it's just object-oriented programming, and then it spits out CloudFormation templates. So it, it's kind of like a compiler. 
uh, but instead of spitting out machine code, it spits out cloud formation, if that makes sense. But um, it's a much quicker way to spit out infrastructure as cloud formation templates at scale versus doing it manually and copy and pasting. Another option that I've seen some people use is Jinja templating. Um, it, this, yeah, this blows Jinja out of the water if, if that's uh, if that's the other option that you've gone with. So our stack spun up, which is cool. Um, I'm gonna go over to the RDS page and show the stack itself. So here it is. This is our um, our cluster, and I I'll be completely honest. I don't know if I can connect to it. I ha um, I don't know what kind of potential settings I would need to have set up for this, but let's go ahead and try it and see what happens. Um, I have to sneeze. Oh, man. Okay. My username is admin and my password. Oh, what's my password? I don't know. Well, oh, that's right. Change it on me. Keep changing the console on me. Um, now I'll show you what the secret stuff looks like. Um, here, so here's here are the credentials, but um, and the output. There's the your secret ARN. This is what the target attachment does, and what this stuff looks like. So it it spits out the username, your default. DB name, your password, cluster identifier, engine, port, host. So you could have, let's say you have three databases. One of them is, are, is MySQL and two are Postgres. You can make all of this stuff just configuration. And as long as you have a generic enough way to connect to your database, probably through an ORM in your code, then it'll just dynamically pull this and connect and it, it should all work seamlessly. Um, that that's the beauty of using a, a target attachment. That's what I like using it for. So um, I I recommend using this. Um, oh, I put download drivers. Okay. Um, th yeah, this th secret target attachments are cool. And also this th password, it's. Uh, Oh, it might not let me connect. It's um, or it's spinning it up. It might be spinning it up. That password it was dynamically generated. I didn't do anything to to create that. Um, with Secrets Manager, another great thing about Secrets Manager is um, you can auto rotate those passwords. You can set it up to auto rotate. So every thirty days or something, there could be a new password in there, and a human could never be involved with it, um, which is that's good stuff. You don't you don't really want a human involved with it. Um, so this might not let me in. Um, see, and those subnets. That's my security group. Should allow. Well, that might be a a larger problem to go about solving. Um, I don't know why I don't have connectivity. Oh, it might be it might be that it was TCP. Might uh, let me go back to that. Let's add a new one. My SQL. No, that was right. Should allow everything.
Hmm. Of course I didn't turn logs on, so that doesn't help, does it? Well, that has been a uh, a difficulty for me lately, is figuring out the networking to my resources. There are no DB connections. Let's see. Three oh six. Admin. Hmm. Oh, I might just not want to connect. Let's see. Well, I'm going to look into a few things real quick, and I will hopefully be right back. So I found this thread. Um, I, I paused for it for quite a bit, actually, um, and looked for some stuff about connected to Aurora serverless DB cluster um, and it seems like it's not possible unless you're already in a VPC um, I will note that the times I'm sorry the times that I have done this in the past um, I have had a direct connection to the VPC like I was in the, the network of the VPC so this hasn't been a problem um, it does make sense though that you wouldn't want to expose this outside of a VPC so um, I'm fine with that um, uh, so I'm gonna try to connect through an EC2 instance that was the uh, suggested way by Amazon was to um, connect through a uh, through an EC2 instance have like a kind of like a middleman um, and then uh, I need to move my key um, like an EC2 instance and then through the EC2 instance you can um, connect correctly uh, I think this is just in my downloads Zero zero. There we go. Um, so this is my EC two instance. I do not have my SQL, so I need to install that. Um, So I just spun up an instance real quick. Um, what? I forget what I made it. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure it'll still work, whatever it is. Um,
Is it MySQL Server? I thought it was. Is this the start MySQL? Yeah, that's why. That's it. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I think just have to get. What does it install it with? Hmm. Do you have to get... Maybe it's just so stripped down that there's no... Uh... Oh, it's Yum. Uh oh. Is it Red Hat? I thought it was Ubuntu. Okay. Whatever. This is my sequel. Okay, cool. Alright. Just a simple EC2 instance. Um, I just spun it up. It's free to eligible. T2 micro. It just go to launch instances, kind of go through everything. Make sure it's in the right VPC and subnet. Um, or it'll try to go to the default VPC, probably wouldn't work then. Uh, I don't know if this is going to work, so, so it, I guess just keep that in mind, but, uh, yeah, um, let's see. Okay. How do you, hmm. yeah, I haven't really used the uh, the CLI before, so this will be new. Nope, oh, that is not what I wanted. This is the host. Let's see if it'll connect. User. All right, there we go. Use default database. There are probably no tables. How do you? Let's see. I'll. Uh, so now I'm connected. So I know I can connect. So that's good. Showing I can connect to the RDS instance. Uh, let's go to RDS. Go to the monitoring, and hopefully soon a connection will pop up. Um, because I am connected. Uh, let's see. My SQL. I. I'm. I'm. I'll be honest. I'm not a database guy. I'm not extremely strong in databases. Um, I've interfaced with them mostly through RMs. I don't know an extreme amount of SQL, so that's why you see me doing this here. Um, but what I'm going to try to do here, um, I just want to create a table. Uh, create table. Hello, and then I want to put uh, your text as a far car two fifty five, and then I'm done. Um, and then let's select all from hello uh, okay let's add um, 
it's an insert, right? Like I said, I'm not extremely proficient at, at SQL. <laughs> insert into hello your text values uh, world. Let's try that. Oops. Do single quotes? Is that it? Okay. Boom. Okay. So there we go. We do have something in the database. So now, um, what I'm going to do, this is actually potentially going to start costing me money, uh, but that's okay. I'm going to exit out of this. Um, and then I'm going to, so the, the, the database is working. That, that's really what I wanted to show. Um, what I'm going to do now is take a snapshot. snapshot take the snapshot and then I want to use this so it's called cluster snapshot so I want to use this to create a new RDS instance so I, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, delete this guy and that'll take that'll take a bit um, Another thing I would say, I would suggest putting maybe like deletion protection on the stack or something like that. Or, um, th there might be a, a good way to go about doing that. Um, it, it, uh, just a way to lock down your resources. Um, you can put a stack policy on it or something like that. So I'm going to add this snapshot in there. So that's what I wanted to start as. Um, I'm curious, maybe the uh, database name, that might get in the way of it, because I'm telling it uh, to have a name uh, when, you know, kind of like the username and password, it would already be there if I'm using a snapshot. So that might get in the way of it, uh, but it might not, who knows, who knows. Um, Either way, I will say the database name is optional. If you don't want to have a default database, that doesn't have to be there. Um, so that, that's something to keep in mind. You can make that a parameter and then also have a, uh, a no value. I'll go ahead and do that now, actually. I, I think that's probably a good thing to do. Um, if it's a new database, uh, Yeah, I'll make this a uh, a string. I'll just make the default called default database. I'll just do it that way. So now if yeah, now we don't have to worry about it. Um oops, don't need that. Now that might yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. I'm guessing it's gonna spin up. See, so it does it creates a final snapshot. This is a thing that RDS does by default. Um if you delete a cluster um, it'll create a snapshot by default. So if someone comes in and accidentally deletes a stack, uh, that's why I put all this stuff in place. Um, this is it's a not the best disaster recovery situation, but you could potentially get yourself out of a sticky situation. Someone goes through, they delete an RDS stack, but you've got a final snapshot. You can recreate it using that snapshot. Um, obviously there would be downtime obviously that wouldn't be the best situation in the world but it's possible so here's 
this is what it would look like. You'd go in here, you'd pull this ARN out, and you would recreate your RDS instance using uh, using that that uh, pre-created or that yeah that that automatic backup that automatic made well snapshot but you know uh, it's there so that's one way to go about doing it um, and that's one of the reasons why I had all this this in place in the first place um, now obviously uh, you would have to know what to do uh, you you would have to have gone through that exercise before um, but uh, so the secret yeah I don't have a name on the secret so we're gonna have to this is NJ so I don't want the NJ uh, PC okay so I create a new one so there's the new now it, it's obvious it's not done yet. I'm just kind of preemptively going in and uh, adding all this stuff in. But um, once the stack is created, so the other one deleted, which is good. This one's going to create, um, and uh, once it's once it's done creating, then I'll connect to it and I'll show that um, that table is still there. That the default database. It's still there. Uh, the hello table is still there, and it should still have an entry for world under the or text column. Um, just showing that it does in fact save it, and it does completely. It rebuilds the the database with a. It's a new database off of an existing cluster with all that data still in there. Um, obviously, the bigger that snapshot is that you're trying to rebuild off of, the longer it's going to take to build your stack uh, and build that cluster just because it's 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 bigger you know um, so some some pros and cons to it there are obviously you know tons of different ways to do disaster recovery in AWS and there are probably better practices to do it but this is kind of a quick and dirty way to include it into templates and to get your mind thinking about it um, but yeah there I, Software projects are going to have different SLAs and, and uptimes and whatnot, um, and they're probably you know companies will probably have disaster recovery uh, plans already built out. Just follow those. Um, yeah, they're, they're going to most likely be people that are thinking about this all day every day, and and those are the people that you'll want to follow and. Uh, let lead you in in this area so um, I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording and I will come back once this cluster is done creating alright so the stack has been created um, this should all I think I have to fully refresh this page but um, this, this should all start working for us um, grab that password Uh-oh. What happened? Huh. Oh, I might have, uh... I wonder if it took down the... I don't know. Ah, you know what it is. So it, yeah, interesting. So yeah, I need to add this in. This secret needs to be protected from deletion. So there's something in CloudFormation. Um, let's see. I think, I think it's just called deletion protection. So you can protect a single 
Uh, deletion policy. Is that it? Hmm. Where is it? Ah, it's a resource. Deletion policy. Yeah. So, in the same way, the... Now, unfortunate. Well, I guess... It's luckily I saved this. Let's go ahead and try this real quick. I'm pretty sure I know what happened, but I'll explain um, my thoughts in just a second. So that worked. So now I'll, I'll use uh, default database. Um, select all from hello. There's our, so this database was completely restored. It's at a new URL and everything. It's a, it's a completely different copy. But one thing to notice, I'm going to start deleting everything just because it'll, uh, it'll start charging money. One thing to notice, um, uh, terminate. One thing to notice was that um, the secret this is the new secret, right? It's got the new host. Everything else is the same, really. But uh, it's got the new host. Um, but this password wouldn't let me access it. If I go back, that secret's gone. The secret, this one, that I luckily still had a tab open for, but this one is gone. However, this original secret is the password that let me into the database. The reason for that is because the manual snapshot, like I said, it's a binary. It takes everything on that machine, including the password. So the new password that was created in here, um, it wasn't valid. This new credentials, it wasn't valid. It didn't need to be there. Um, because if I'm using a snapshot DB, it uses the old secret. This target attachment didn't need to be there, none of that. Um, that can get confusing. Um, and this is just one area that, you know, I, you need to really be careful who has access to stacks, who has access to create and delete things. Uh, because I could have lost the password for this database, which would have been all right. I'm just playing around, but you could have lost the password to this database. Um, so what I'm going to do now is add deletion, a, a deletion policy to this guy. And I want to retain him. I want to retain the secret because if I ever lose the secret, I'm going to lose the secret or the credentials to the database. And I'm also going to, I think you can put a condition on an entire resource. I think you can do that. Let's see. Resources. So at the top level, I can put a condition in. Conditions or condition condition for is new DB because I only want to create these credentials if it's a new database. And I'm going to do the same thing with the target attachment. I only want to create it if it's a new database. Otherwise, don't create the secret. Just leave the old one. And since this this deletion policy is now set to retain, whenever I delete this CloudFormation stack, which I'm going to do right now, um, so what it'll do right now, by default, that deletion policy for the cluster is to create a snapshot 
for the secret in the future, it will be to just keep the secret. They'll just keep the secret, which is a good thing. We want to keep the secret because we can spin the, the old database back up and still use the old secret. We still have all the old information in there. We can still use it um, to, to access the database that was recreated using the snapshot. Um, it's just the, the old secrets are still there. Um, so I, I'll, I'll bring up a point now. I exported the secret ARN. Um, I would suggest that there might have to potentially be manual intervention if it gets to this point, but um, I would suggest having the ARN uh, if it's used in code, if those secrets are dynamically pulled in code using Secrets Manager, using the SDK or API calls, have the secret ARN be an environment variable that you can set. So, and, and if you have to go through this sequence where you're creating off of a snapshot, then the old secret is what would be put into the environment variable so that uh, the correct secrets actually being pulled because we would want to pull this secret even though this doesn't exist anymore so you would probably have to this is unfortunate but you would probably have to um, edit the secret or you, there would have to be some manual intervention um, obviously best case scenario is no one deletes the stack uh, but this is one way to get around it. Not the most eloquent. Uh, but this is one way to get around it. Um, I've also in the in the past I've I've seen uh, uh, there there is one singular secret um, that's given to an environment variable, and then any time a new database is created, it's just a given that that will be updated. You can create a custom CloudFormation resource to update the the steady secret or the long running secret with the new secrets information. So the host name will be updated, but the password will be the same. You can have some custom logic in there, um, but that there's a long running secret that contains the actual, the most recent up to date secret of the database. That's another way to do it. But uh, yeah, tons of different ways to uh, get around all this stuff. Um, but I did, uh, I, I did complete what I set out to do, which was to create an RDS instance, uh, spin it up, show that we could connect it, show that we could um, configure it or recreate it based off of a snapshot, um, and that that snapshot did actually pull up what we wanted it to. So I am going to finish deleting this stack, and then... Uh, uh, I think this is a good place to end the video. So I hope you got something out of it. And uh, thank you for watching. Until next time.